the issues that Michael Collins is going to be talking about. I am just terribly excited to see you all here. My name is Cheryl St. Germain. I'm the director of the Center for Excellence in Arts and Humanities, which is a co-sponsor of this event. And I just want to thank a couple, a few of our other co-sponsors. This is also uh, the, the lecture of the Donald R. Benson Lecture in Literature, Sciences, and the Arts, which is a, a lecture series in the honor of Donald Benson, who was very interested in literature, science, and the arts. We also have co-sponsors in the bioethics program, the Committee on Lectures, funded by the government of the student body, and the Leopold Center. I want to remind you also that after this talk, we are going to have a book signing and reception, and uh, uh, please stay around and buy some books and get them signed, and we'll also have a question and answer session. I am now going to turn this over to, to Fred Kirshenman, the director of the Leopold Center, who will introduce to you Michael Cole. I fell in love with uh, Michael Pollan's writing back in 1991 after the public. Is that that? Okay. <laughs> um, I fell in love with Michael Pollan's writing back in 1991 uh, after he published uh, Second Nature. And um, at the time, I was in North Dakota on my farm and had been working at that for about uh, 12 years trying to figure out how to fit the farm into nature. Um, I had read Thoreau, as Michael also had, I've discovered, and uh, we both felt that somehow that human activity had to be folded into nature in a way that we didn't disturb it too much, as, as Thoreau had suggested. And the problem I had that the blackbirds wanted to eat my sunflowers and the coyotes wanted to eat my calves and um, the deer and the wild ducks and the wild geese uh, ate just about any crop I had out there. And so I was trying to figure out how I was going to manage all of that. And then I started to read Second Nature and found that here was this editor of an urban magazine, Harper's, um, who I was sure was an urban environmentalist. And here he was struggling with the same problem as he had purchased uh, a place in the country in Connecticut and was struggling with putting a garden into the nature, into nature in the same way that I was trying to put my farm into nature. And um, so Michael, in his wonderful way, was describing in this book the struggle which he had in trying to do this. And it finally came down to a woodchuck. And the woodchuck insisted on eating the vegetables out of his garden. And he was, of course, trying to have the garden be as much a part of nature as possible, so he didn't have a fence around it or anything. And so Michael and the woodchuck kept going on with this competition which they had with one another, in which he was determined that because he was a human with a large brain and therefore smarter than this stupid woodchuck, that somehow he had to be able to outwit him. And it finally got down to a point where, as Michael said, it was no longer about the vegetables, it was about winning. <laughs> and so I want to share with you a couple of paragraphs from this wonderful book, Second Nature, uh, when it finally gets down to where it really becomes a serious competition. I decided, decided now to incinerate the woodchuck in his burrow. <laughs> I had seen an item on the, on the news concerning cabin fires aboard jetliners. In order to test a new, supposedly less combustible fuel, the FAA had simulated a cabin fire. And the footage they showed of fire racing wildly through the narrow enclosure space gave me an idea of exactly the sort of end that the woodchuck deserved. <laughs> Take a moment to picture it. So I poured maybe a gallon of gasoline down the burrow, waited five minutes for it to fan out along the various passageways, and lit a match. Evidently, there was not much oxygen down there because the flame shot in the wrong direction, <laughs> up toward my face. I leapt back before I was singed too badly and watched a black-orange fountain of flame flare out from the earth and reached the overhang olive bush. 
I managed to smother the fire with earth before the whole garden went up. I guess that was my destroy the village in order to save it phase. <laughs> While Michael finally worked things out, and uh, those of you who have read the book know, and those of you who didn't, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, spoil the suspense for you, uh, just encourage you to read it because it really is a wonderful book. But he finally came up with three metaphors uh, of how we should be a part of nature in a way that nature also uh, sustains itself. And then came up with 10 wonderful ethical principles of gardening. And those three metaphors and those 10 principles have stood me well all these years as I struggle with trying to figure out how to do my farm. And so, Michael, it is extreme pleasure for me to introduce you to all my friends and colleagues and neighbors and students here at Iowa. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful introduction, Fred. I appreciate that. Um, I brought a few groceries I'm just going to put out before I start talking. A little bit of milk. Anyone ever tried these uh, Lunchables? Um, recognize this. I see it's sold right upstairs. And this. I'll get to all this in a minute. But very familiar. Um, but I'd like to start by thanking first Fred for that wonderful introduction. Fred is a, uh, has been a hero of mine as, as long as I've, I've known him. And um, I've learned a lot from him. I've actually learned a lot from several people on this campus. And it, it's, it's almost ironic that I should be invited back here to tell you anything about food and the food system, because I learned so much of it right here. Um, interviewing Fred, uh, Rich Pirog, other, uh, his other colleagues at the Leopold Center, uh, Ricardo Salvador. Um, when I was doing some research about corn about two years ago, I spent a couple days on campus and learned a great deal, some of which I'm going to feed back to you in a kind of active uh, literary recycling. I hope you'll um, be okay with that. Uh, I want to thank also uh, Martha Benson for sponsoring this, for the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities, for their part in this, the Bioethics Program, uh, and the Committee on Lectures. Uh, it, it truly is a great pleasure to be back in Ames, uh, where, as I say, I've learned so much. Um, so I brought these groceries to make a point. And that is that I greet you not as an expert, not as a professor, not as an authority, food scientist, farmer, uh, but as a consumer. I'm a consumer of food. Um, and what I want to do is try to bring an ecological lens to some of these items, something we seldom do. We seldom see things like a Big Mac as, as really part of our relationship to the natural world. Um, but it is, and it's in fact one of our most important relationships to the natural world. Um, and my simplest bottom line point this evening is that we too, like every other creature, you know, we define creatures essentially by how they fit into a food chain. What do they eat and what eats it? Um, and the same goes for us, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, today. Um, we are defined by what we eat, how we produce it. Um, and this, more than anything else, determines how we fit into the fabric of nature. There's an ecologist who once wrote, I don't even have his name, but I've seen it quoted a few times, all of nature is a conjugation of the verb to eat in both its active and passive forms, tenses. We're going to concentrate on the active tense today. Um, we are just like any other animal in this respect, except that we get to design our food chains to an unprecedented extent. Um, and in fact, we now have three or four different food chains. And I'm going to talk about a couple of them. I'm going to talk about three of them, actually. Um, now, it's true, I'm not like any old consumer. I, 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 I get paid to explore our food chain. And I sometimes think of myself in the series of pieces I've been doing for the New York Times Magazine uh, as, as a food detective, um, in that I, I enjoy taking a uh, uh, a food like this, or uh, this one I, I wrote a whole 20,000 word piece about. Uh, this is an organic TV dinner produced by Cascadian Farm uh, that I kind of followed back to its uh, 
uh, roots on the farm. Um, and I've written about uh, genetically modified potatoes um, this way that I grew in my garden. Uh, I wrote a long story, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, following a, a steer from insemination to slaughter. And currently I'm, I'm doing some research, and that's what brought me to Ames, following a bushel of corn through the whole food chain, uh, culminating in a meal at McDonald's. Um, I can't talk about all these stories, all these food detective stories, but uh, I'll talk about a couple and we can talk about others if you like during the question period. Now this idea of being a food detective is, is an interesting um, job description. When I thought about it, it didn't really exist 50 or 100 years ago. Um, the idea that we would need a journalist to tell us where our food comes from is, uh, is pretty novel, but that is indeed where we find ourselves, um, that people like me can make a perfectly good living telling people what everybody once knew. Um, so I'm not going to complain about the, the length or intricacy of our food chain. Um, let's talk about the industrial food chain. There's a few ways to tell the story of that. Um, but I started, I was launched looking launched to look into it by an editor at the Times Magazine. And as my editors will often do, they have these one word ideas for articles. And they'll go out, we'll have a nice long lunch, and we'll talk about everything. But finally, they'll say, we want you to write an article about, and then I get the word, meat. So OK, what about meat? They don't know. They don't know beyond that. They just know, this is what editors are good at, that people had anxiety about meat. People were wondering about meat. This is after mad cow disease. This is after various E. coli outbreaks of food poisoning. Somehow, tell us what's going on with meat. Uh, you remember, I write for editors in New York about things that happen in places like Iowa. And um, so I decided I would learn what I could. And I chose beef as the meat I would focus on, because there was this anxiety about um, mad cow disease. Um, and I was starting to have questions about, was it, you know, safe to eat beef? Was it, was it morally or environmentally uh, responsible to eat beef? Um, and also, how in the world did we ever get to the point where we could sell a hamburger for 99 cents in this country? Um, you know, this is a, once was a luxury food to eat beef. It's something people did once a week, maybe. Um, how did it get to be so cheap? So I set out on this journey. And I'll, I'll take you through a, a couple little chapters of it. Um, and tell you how I went about figuring out how we get a 99 cent burger. Um, I found some ranchers in South Dakota, Vale, South Dakota, the Blair brothers. And I called them up and I said, I want to tell the story about one steer. Uh, I want to um, uh, follow a steer from your farm, if, if I could, through, through the whole food system. And the Blair brothers were fine with it, and they invited me out. And I came and I spent a couple days on their ranch. And, and this was kind of a, a very pastoral segment of the industrial food chain. And I was surprised how pastoral it was, that what they were doing was not so different than what their parents and their grandparents had been doing, which was it was a cow-calf operation uh, run on uh, this you know, gorgeous uh, western South Dakota land. Um, and one of the questions I, I always ask is, how do things used to be as opposed to how they are now? How do things get to be the way they are? Because I think history is a very important way of understanding things. And uh, Rich Blair said, well, in my dad's time, it took four years to get a, uh, a steer to slaughter. And in my, dad, in my father's time, it went down to, in my granddad's time, it was four years. My dad's time was two to three years. And we're doing it in 14 months. And he also said, and you know, the industry's battle cry now is 1,100 pounds in 11 months. And they're going to do it. I'm sure they'll figure out how to do it. So I got very curious to know how you could shave that much time off the development of, a, of an animal. And um, I also became to realize that fast food really does begin on the ranch with this kind of speeding up of uh, the cow's life. So the key is, as the Blair brothers explained to me, and I learned pretty quickly, is you get them on, off of grass and onto corn as fast as you can. Corn is really the key term in turning beef into uh, cheap hamburger. Um, the problem is that cattle did not evolve to eat corn. Um, they evolved to eat grass, something they're remarkably good at. They can do something none of us can do, which is digest grass, take this, all this cellulose grown by the sun, essentially, and turn it into uh, high-quality protein. 
But grass is slow. Grass is only green part of the year. Whereas corn is so cheap and abundant, thanks in large part to the, the genius of farmers in, in this state, um, is so cheap and so abundant that if you can get them onto this very uh, rich, compact, high caloric feed quickly, they will grow more quickly. Um, problem is it makes them sick. So you've got to deal with that. And what happens is, six months, they wean the animals, they bring them in, and they basically teach them how to eat in the feedlot. They get them ready for feedlot life. And that consists of accustoming them to corn. And to do that, you also have to start giving them drugs. Because if they get onto corn too early and too fast, um, they will get acidosis, they will get bloat, um, a lot of bad things will happen. Um, so they go to kind of, uh, they call the prep school for the feedlot, and that was in the, um, uh, uh, the little feedlot they set up there. Um, and at that moment, I kind of saw the two worlds coming into tension, the world of industrial beef and the feedlot, and the world of cattle grazing on grass as they were, they've evolved to do. And there were two logics really coming in to, into, into focus there. And that's really my, my, my subject tonight, is one of them is the logic of evolution and biology and ecology, and the other is the logic of industry. They're both very powerful. They both are capable of wondrous things. Um, corn, in this case, when you're feeding cattle, represents the logic of industry. It makes great sense if you conceive of this animal as a factory into which you are putting a certain kind of feed to get out a certain kind of protein. And there is a, a ratio, about seven to one. Seven to one, put in the corn, you'll get a pound of, um, pound of protein. Um, so that factory metaphor, to conceive of that animal as a factory, suddenly everything is sensible, including the feeding of corn, even though you have to make up for it with various tricks. On the other hand, you have this logic of nature, which unfortunately is very slow, uh, relatively. Um, doesn't give you fast food beef. Um, so you see what can make sense industrially can be almost insane um, in, in, the, in the logic of nature. Um, because here you are is taking a perfectly healthy animal and sickening it in some low-level way. Uh, and indeed, for the rest of this animal's life, it will have low-level um, heartburn, essentially, uh, and be prone to uh, acidosis and bloat. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about, as, as dinner gets further into the past, a little bit more about what happens inside this animal. Um, and that I found, that, that clash of logics, <coughs> I have found cuts through our food system in many, many different ways. And not, not always where you'd think. It cuts right through organic food as well. Um, anyway, so while I was there, I decided I wanted to pick out an animal that I would follow. And I asked them to help me choose what's a good one. I want to pick out one that's going to like grade prime. Um, so how do you look at cow, you know, how do you look at cow flesh and figure that out? And they told me, and I picked out number 534. And then Rich Blair's brother said, hey, if you really want to understand our business, why don't you buy this animal? We'll sell them to you. And I thought it was a kind of a racket, you know. They were going to unload a, a crummy animal on me. But no, they were willing to let me have a really good one. And I paid the sale barn price, which was for this animal of this quality, was about $600 at that age. And uh, I thought that was kind of a good idea. And I would own this animal through the whole process. By doing that, I would, I think, be able to see it a little bit more from the rancher's point of view. Um, so I bought my animal. And then I arranged to have a reunion with 534 which I did not name in the article. I didn't want to sentimentalize him, even though I'll tell you, my son saw a picture of him and named him Knight because he was black. But I didn't want us to get too attached to, uh, to Knight. Um, so I arranged a few months later, this was in November, I arranged to meet the animal in uh, where he was going, to the feedlot, which was in Garden City, Kansas. Anyone ever been to Garden City, Kansas? OK, so you know what it's like. It's, um, it's a really surprising place, given what, what you might have thought Kansas was, coming from New York or Connecticut. Um, it was this very smelly town with a lot of really good Mexican restaurants. 
it was really smelly because of all the feedlots. This is where feedlots began. The first feedlot in America was in Garden City. Um, and when I got in my rental car, now you're, you're accustomed to driving on country roads and being surprised by the odors, I know, in, in this state too. But uh, I had never smelled anything quite like it. And I got in my rental car, and it was dark and kind of foggy at night, and I started driving into town. And um, suddenly, uh, and the windows are closed, it's, it's cold, it's, it's January, um, there is this smell, this ungodly smell. And, but it doesn't smell like cows or cow manure. I know what that smells like. I come from a dairy state. Um, it just, it smelled like the bus station at Port Authority in New York. And, <laughs> and it got worse and worse, and I thought it was coming from in the car. I, I couldn't imagine it was coming from outside of the car. And I developed this whole fantasy where the, the guy who had rented this car before me was so mad it hurts, because here we were in the middle of nowhere, and they were charging like $90 a day to rent a car, because they had a monopoly at the airport. And so I thought, he got so pissed off that he urinated in the back seat. It was the only way I could, I could explain the smell. And I decided I was going to turn around and take it back and ask for another car. Well, the windows were all fogged, and I couldn't see where I was going. So I had to roll down the window before I could make a U-turn. And when I rolled down the window, it was like, boom. I realized there's no point in turning around. This is just, this is environmental. Um, so. That was my introduction to, to Garden City. Um, the next morning I woke up, and it wasn't that way every, all the time. I was passing through a feedlot, and uh, not the one where 534 was. But I started heading down uh, the road to, to 534s the next day, and I saw a site that, I, that, that to this day impresses me as one of the wonders of the, uh, of the natural world, or the unnatural world, um, which was a, a really big American feedlot, 40,000 animals. Um, the, all of a sudden, the prairie just gives way to black. And it's the black of the soil, which of course isn't soil, and it's the black of the animals. Um, and they're arranged in these pens, and it looks like a subdivision, and it's going all the way to the horizon. And in the middle, it, it, it's a city, I realize. It, it's got that orthogonal, you know, it's got all the fences and, and, and the roads, and, um, and in the middle is a cathedral. And it's really a medieval city. Um, and in the cathedral was this five-story feed mill that's chugging 24 hours a day. Um, and everything's organized around this feed mill. And I say it's like a medieval city because um, it's filthy. There is uh, waste in the streets. There is no sanitation. Um, it's 13th century London plus antibiotics. <laughs> and it's cows instead of people. Um, and it was uh, a, stunning, a stunning place to visit. And the first stop was the feed mill. And here, what, what, what's going on there, and this is one of the places all, you know, that the corn in Iowa is going, um, is uh, it's basically grinding that corn, turning it into flakes, crushing it, steaming it and crushing it to make it more digestible. And I, saw, and I tasted these flakes, and they, you know, they look just like corn flakes. They're just a little soggy. Um, they taste corny. And, um, but then they get mixed with a lot of things I didn't want to taste, uh, like tallow, like blood meal, uh, all, both from cows, by the way. Even with our rules about mad cow disease, we are still feeding blood meal to cows from cows and still feeding fat from cows to cows. That is all allowed under the, the new tightened rules to protect us from mad cow disease. Um, and uh, mixed with urea, essentially pure fertilizer. Um, and mixed with hormones and antibiotics. That is the daily chow. Um, the recipe is 80 to 90 percent corn, and there's some corn silage. There's very, very little roughage in this. Um, I met Dr. Mel, the vet, and uh, all he deals with on this place, there are three, there are three vets, uh, is epic cases of indigestion. Um, animals that come in sick uh, because of acidosis and bloat and pneumonia. Um, and I asked him about this, and um, he described what bloat is. Bloat is essentially when the rumination, I had to learn a lot about rumen nutrition to write this piece, and probably more than any of us need to know, but um, when rumination stops, rumination depends on a lot of roughage in the diet and this, and this, and this ability of, of cows to uh, essentially regurgitate and burp. Uh, well, this, this heavy, starchy gruel they're eating uh, basically forms a, a, 
a scum uh, at the top of their rumens and, and the air can't get out. And they're not ruminating because there's not enough roughage. And these burps, essentially, of gas get bigger and bigger and bigger until they actually uh, expand and crush their lungs and heart, and they can die. This they get from too, eating too much corn. It can be dealt with in various ways uh, by taking drugs. Um, and Dr. Mel said, and the other problem is that they all get sick uh, because the, the corn acidifies their rumen to such an extent in their digestive tract that lesions open up. They're not used to an acid diet. They're used to a base diet. Lesions open up, bacteria get into the bloodstream and infect their livers, and they have lesions in the livers. Um, and Dr. Mel just shrugged. I said, well, so why do you have all these problems? I mean, cows don't normally have all these problems. And he said, that's right. Well, they're evolved to, he said, um, they're evolved to eat forage, and we're making them eat grain. So it's just a cost of doing business. It's still worth it to have a lot of sick cows that you treat. Uh, it still makes industrial sense. Again, you're conceiving of this animal as a factory. Um, I told you I decided to own this steer, and there are a couple reasons I did that, and that was because I didn't want to write about this process and condemn it from the point of view of a journalist from New York. I wanted to be, um, I wanted my readers to understand how a rancher, a person who's trying to grow good food for people, who's just trying to make a living, would find himself making decisions as, such as sending this animal to a feedlot and implanting a hormone in that animal. This is something that's considered controversial in a lot of the world, but we routinely uh, put hormone implants either in the diet or in these animals. Um, and I, it was, was my animal, and I had the choice. I could either put in the hormone implant or I could say I don't want to do it. And I asked Dr. Mel about it, and I asked other people about it, what they thought. And um, they said, well, basically, it, it, costs, you, um, it costs you about a dollar and it's going to add 20 pounds to the weight of this animal, so it's going to be worth about $20 to you. So it's a $1 investment, $20, um, and you know, so you're not going to make any money. That's a pretty good margin on an animal. So you're not going to make any money if you don't do this. So I kind of saw the point. Um, and that was basically the whole profit margin. And I said to him, well, there's some questions about the safety of putting all these hormones into, into uh, these animals and that the hormones don't stay in the animals, they end up in the water and there are problems with the sexuality of the frogs downstream and there may, who knows, be problems with the people who eat the meat uh, who are exposed to more hormones than they would be otherwise. And in fact, Europe has banned the use of putting hormones in uh, meat. And he said, well, it's a competitive necessity. And I said, well, no, not really. What if everybody stopped doing this? If, if it were banned and you weren't allowed to do it in America, nobody would be at a competitive disadvantage. And you know what? He looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, you don't understand. We're not competing with each other. We're competing with the chicken people. <laughs> and if the price of beef goes up relative to chicken, that, that's really bad for us. We're, and I realized they saw themselves as protein producers. And it's the cost of producing their protein is higher than producing chicken protein. The reason for that is a chicken can take two pounds of corn and turn it into one pound of meat, whereas the beef member is seven pounds to one. So they're at a disadvantage. So anything that's going to shrink that margin, they have to do. So if you think you're competing with chicken when you're growing beef, you're going to put in hormones. Um, anyway, so after looking around and getting my tour and hanging out with Dr. Mel and learning about bloat and acidosis, I went to meet to have my reunion with 534. Um, there I was. I found his pen. I drove up to it. Looked like it had a pretty good location. He had a water view, kind of <laughs> sloped up a hill. I thought he was being treated pretty well. Although then I realized that wasn't exactly a water view. It was a manure lagoon. Um, and it, up close, it didn't look as good as it did from a distance. Um, and I asked the, the, the cowpoke who was with me about this, and he said, well, yeah, we just kind of put it all, they never dig out these pens or, or clear them out, but the water, everything is kind of sloped down to this lagoon, so all the waste collects in this lagoon. And I said, well, can't, this must be really good fertilizer. Can't you just spray it on the, on the field? And said, oh, no, 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 this, this would kill. This would kill corn and stuff. Um, it's just so intense and has so many chemicals of various kinds in it. So they just let the sun kind of bake it, and it evaporates. So it goes into the air, essentially, is where a lot of it goes. It's not just the water that evaporates. Nitrogen evaporates, too. Um, so, and that, that whole idea of a waste problem on a farm 
I mean, you know, that's a new problem. That is an industrial problem. Um, if you had farms on the, if you had cows on the, on the uh, farms where you also had the corn and the other crops, obviously all that manure would be an incredible asset. Um, it represents fertility, not pollution. Um, it's all a matter of context and scale. And Wendell Berry has the best quote about this. I mean, when we started moving animals off of the farms, and that's largely happened in, in Iowa, and put them onto feedlots, we, we essentially took a solution, which is to say animal waste and fertility, and neatly divided into two problems, which is a fertility crisis on the farm and a waste crisis at the feedlot. Um, so we've taken a solution and turned it into two problems. Um, Anyway, I wore this orange sweater when I went to meet him, to, to have my reunion, because that's what I'd been wearing when I met him. It was a really bright orange sweater, and I was hoping I'd get some kind of glint of recognition from 534. And, but nothing, absolutely nothing. And there was 534, and he was, uh, didn't recognize me, and he was standing around in these pens. And the animals in a feedlot, you know, Compared to pigs indoors, compared to chickens indoors, they, they actually have it pretty good. They're outside. Um, but it's a pretty depressed bunch of cows um, on the feedlot. And they are, um, uh, as I stood there watching my cow, my steer, pardon me, I keep calling him a cow. I know it's a steer. Um, dip his huge head into this trough that was fed several times a day from the feedlot. Um, uh, this mixture of, of, of corn and, and blood and drugs and tallow. And, um, you know, he's supposed to be a machine, but there was another way to look at him. And that was as an animal in a web of ecological relationships. And standing there in the, in the, in the feedlot, I tried to summon them and, and figure out what they are. And, you could follow them in two directions. He was essentially eating corn. That was the main, the main 80 to 90%. And I could follow that corn back to a farm in Iowa or Kansas, wherever that, that happened to be grown. And to grow that corn so cheaply, of course, cost a lot of money. Cost a lot in, in many, many different ways. Um, that, that way of raising cattle depends on this huge monoculture of corn not just in Iowa, but all over America. You know, there's an area of corn the so twice the size of New York State now. It's a crop that, as I'm sure you've heard many, many times, uses more herbicide and pesticide than any other crop. Um, it's a crop whose uh, runoff um, pollutes streams, uh, pollutes the drinking water in Des Moines, goes down into the, into the Mississippi, contributes to the dead zone in the Gulf. There is a connection between that and my cow eating corn there. Um, every bushel of that corn took a half a gallon of fossil fuel or natural gas to grow. Um, so that, that animal is also implicated in the fuel economy. Um, uh, so you've got the problem in the Gulf of Mexico, and you have also the problem in the Persian Gulf, defending the oil that allows us to grow that corn to feed animals that way. Um, and my steer alone, one steer responsible for 100 gallons of fossil fuel, mostly in its fertilizer, the fertilizer to grow the corn and move it around. Um, so look what we've done. We've taken this animal, this, this brilliant solar collector, because um, essentially what a, what, a, what a ruminant on grass is, I mean, just think about that other food chain, that very short elegant food chain where the sun feeds the grass and the grass feeds the ruminant and the ruminant feeds us. That's it. That's all you need. It works. And if you've ever seen a cow, uh, you know, turning its broadside to the sun to warm its rumen, to move that process along, um, it's, it's a wonder. Um, but it's just not good enough. It's not good enough for the industrial logic. So we take that solar organism, and we turn it into essentially a fossil fuel guzzling machine. You know, just the absolute last thing we need another one of. Um, but that's essentially what we've done with our cattle. Um, and that's what I mean, I think, when I say the high cost of cheap food. That 99 cent burger has all those costs in it. Um, the cost of the pollution from growing the corn, the cost of maintaining that fuel supply, 
uh, and they're not counted. And then there are public health costs too, because you can follow that food chain. Again, let's take, it, let's take it in the other direction. We've taken it back to the farm. Let's take it from that, that animal standing in that feedlot to us, the people eating this stuff. Well, what happens there? Well, you can follow the beef, and you'll find some other costs. One is food poisoning. E. coli 0157H7, the most serious kind of microbe that you can get uh, that kills children, that, that destroys kidney function. Um, that, too, is a product of feedlot beef. Why is that? Well, essentially, grass-fed beef um, do not develop E. coli. E. coli, this particular E. coli, evolved in the gut of animals that had had their digestive systems acidified. There's a wonderful kind of barrier in nature between the, the human digestive tract, which is very acidic, uh, and that of a ruminant like a cow, which is very base. So that the organisms that can survive in the cow's digestive system get zapped by our gastric acids really quickly. But if you transform the, uh, the digestive system of the cow and you make it acidic, then the microbes that evolve to survive in that environment, lo and behold, can survive their passage through our digestive system. And E. coli 0157 is, uh, is one of those organisms. Uh, and in fact, studies have been done by USDA researchers and uh, people at Cornell that simply by taking animals off of corn for five days and putting them on grass or hay, they will shed 80% of the E. coli in their systems. Very simple solution, but doesn't suit the industry. They'd much rather irradiate the beef because it's really complicated to give that many animals grass or bring that much hay to them. Um, and that's a real trait of industrial food system. When there is a problem, like pollution, uh, agricultural pollution, you don't go back to the solution that existed before the problem was created. Um, you make money with a new business, fixing it, band-aids. And a lot of industrial agriculture, uh, a lot of what happens in, in, in schools like this one, is inventing a series of very ingenious, effective fixes for problems created by the failure to go back a little bit further. Um, so that's one, you know, and we're told this, we're, you know, um, that, that uh, don't eat your hamburger rare anymore. You're, you're taking your life in your hands. Um, it's inevitable because we slaughter these animals at incredible rates, 400 an hour at a slaughterhouse. If you read Fast Food Nation, I mean, he, he details how this goes, and he has a very stunning line at the end of it. If you're, if you're slaughtering animals that quickly and, and that kind of um, situation, uh, manure will get into the process. It's inevitable because the animals are coated with it. They're coming off a feedlot. Um, and he says very bluntly at the end of one chapter, the shit gets on the meat. Um, but the shit is very different than it would be if these animals uh, had been on grass. Um, and then there are the antibiotics, and there are problems um, that we've read about. I won't go into great detail, but that is another public health cost of growing animals in a way that requires them to get antibiotics every day, and which is when we need antibiotics, when our children have ear infections, um, they won't work as well because we've been essentially breeding in the guts of these animals, um, in, their, in their places where they live, we've been breeding microbes that can withstand our best antibiotics. Um, and then there is the, the health effects of eating this kind of meat. Um, when you feed animals corn as opposed to grass, it's not the same meat, um, which you would figure. I mean, what you eat affects you. And uh, in fact, when you feed animals corn, their meat is very high in saturated fat. Um, it has more omega, uh, more omega-6, less omega-3. Um, essentially, grass-fed meat has the nutritional profile of wild game. Um, and many of the problems we associate with meat eating in this country, uh, um, uh, cardiovascular disease and things like that, and obesity, are really a result of corn-fed meat, um, which is not the, uh, the kind of all-American apple pie virtue that we've been taught. And I was very surprised to learn that. Um, but again, the industrial logic overcomes this biological logic, the logic of eating a grass-fed animal. Um, so there are some more high costs of cheap food in terms of public health, environmental health. Uh, and I haven't even talked to, and I'm not going to talk about the misery to which we subject these animals. Um, 
As ecology tells us, the first rule of ecology, it's all connected, it's all of a piece. Um, that 90, from that 99 cent burger, you can learn why it's hard to find an antibiotic that works in the hospital, why there's a dead zone in the Gulf, and there are sometimes blue baby alerts in Des Moines in the spring, why eating a fast food hamburger has become a gastrointestinal adventure, um, and even why, we're in, why one of the reasons we're in the other Gulf. Um, we are what we eat, it's often said, but the ecology of food chains teaches us it doesn't stop there. I have to read this because I get this wrong otherwise. We are what what we eat eats too. Um, we are what what we eat eats too. And what we're really eating at McDonald's is cheap corn and oil. So that's the depressing part of my talk. Now we'll move toward sweetness and light. Um, I originally thought that organic was the alternative I was looking for as a, as a consumer. Um, and you see I've got organic milk here, and I've got my organic TV dinner here. Um, and that organic by nature would be more in keeping with nature, would, would as Fred was talking about, fit itself into the natural world more um, uh, gracefully than industrial. Um, but as it turns out, the industrial logic, especially in, a, in a, an economy like ours, in a globalized world like ours, in a culture of Walmart and supermarkets like ours, the industrial logic is so powerful um, that it can distort organic also. And, and it has done that. Um, there's, a, there's somebody in my department, I teach at Berkeley now, and um, uh, I was talking to a, a, a friend, a Mexican um, scientist there, and I was talking about all this work I'd done on corn. And by the way, something else to tell you about all this, all this food here, this is maple syrup with quotation marks around it. It's actually um, high fructose corn syrup. Um, uh, all this food is corn. This is at the other end of the food chain that begins here in Iowa. Milk, soda, um, this um, chicken dish, uh, this fun fuels, corn upon corn upon corn, the Big Mac. It, these are all manifestations of corn. And I was talking to this friend and I was saying, you know, I've been looking at the corn system and I've been following this bushel of corn from Iowa and I keep finding all these foods that have corn in them. And if you've looked and, you know, I really, I, I think we're, we're more the people of corn than the Mexicans are who call themselves the people of corn. They understand how dependent they are on this grain, but we are really the people of corn because the Mexicans are still sweetening their, their uh, sodas with cane sugar and they're still fattening a lot of their cattle on grass, although less all the time since NAFTA. And he said, well, you know, you could prove that. I said, really? He says, yeah, go talk to Todd Dawson. He's in the biology department, and he operates a mass spectrometer. And um, you could take uh, any kind of, you could take a fingernail or, or, or a, a lock of hair, and you can put it in this machine, and it will tell you where, you know, we're all made of carbon, right? We're the member in Star Trek. We're the carbon life form. Well, where does that carbon come from? Well, all that carbon was once in the air and some plant at some point in the food chain, um, and leaving aside seafood for now, um, uh, would fix that carbon in an active photo, episode of photosynthesis. And so that's, you know, fundamentally what we're made of. And that most of the carbon that we're made of, those of us who've been alive in this country in the second half of the 20th century, is corn. Um, and that the identity of the corn in this burger and in that soda is still preserved so that you can tell that the carbon in there uh, came from a C4 plant uh, and the odds are that that plant is corn. And I was kind of stunned by that. Um, so I sent some students to do a little work on that and we actually tested some organic milk and some organic meat and lo and behold, it was corn too. Um, what's happened in organic is that the... Um, the industrial logic of, for example, putting cattle on uh, feedlots, dairy cows, and feeding them a very uh, rich diet of grain, um, rather than putting them on grass, um, is, uh, is taking over. Uh, some of the largest, this is um, milk that was produced in Colorado at a new dairy that has 5,000 organic cows uh, on 100 acres of land um, and shipped all over the country. Um, so we now have organic feedlots. Are they 
you know, they're, are they better than industrial feedlots? Well, yeah, they can't use drugs. Um, they're, they're probably marginally better. They probably have to give it more roughage in their diets so they don't get so sick. Um, and um, as I followed this, the products in this TV dinner around, um, I realized that organic had changed a lot and that the, the consumer's image of it and what it has become is very different. And I don't, I want to be careful not to, to uh, be overly damning of it because I'm overdrawing this a little bit. I mean, there are plenty of organic dairies who still keep their animals on grass. Um, but you can't assume that the kind of supermarket pastoral image that's presented about organic is necessarily true. There are two organics now. There's an industrial organic and there is a sort of more, I don't know what to call it. I mean, some farmers call it beyond organic or artisanal agriculture. Um, and uh, so you have to be careful as a consumer. And uh, in this piece on the industrialization of organic, I, I spent a lot of time kind of trying to figure out what happened to how the movement got turned into an industry. And really, it's driven by this industrial logic, which is very powerful. Um, if you're selling a commodity, which you are if you're selling milk uh, in a, or, or beef, um, the only way to, to, to survive, the only competitive strategy when you're selling a commodity is to become the least cost producer. And the way that any industry does that is by substituting capital in the form of technology and fossil fuels for labor. Um, that's how you make your product cheaper. But as you make your product cheaper, your margins go down. So you have to make more of it. You have to take advantage of economies of scale and produce more. Um, and there's a, there's a very vicious logic you get into. And it's very hard to be small and survive in that, in that kind of market. So many organic farmers have kind of fallen out of that market. And it's been taken over by, actually, people like these folks, organic, uh, earthbound organic. Um, which is not an evil company. I don't, I'm not saying any of these guys are evil. Uh, I'm just saying that they're not always doing what consumers think they're doing. Um, they make bagged lettuce, all the bagged lettuce you see in the supermarket. Um, and they, they, they sell hundreds of millions of dollars of it every year um, in a very industrialized system that to look at it is no different than any other lettuce operation in the Salinas Valley. Um, and what you find is that all the qualities of, uh, of the industrial system, I mean, and here I'll just list a couple of these, these traits, have come into organic agriculture too. Uh, specialization, the pressure to move toward a monoculture even there um, because uh, the market has more trouble dealing with the polyculture. Um, and there is a great need for organic grain, organic, um, and so you have farmers who instead of having really the long rotations and the and relations with animals to bring in fertility, get into input substitution, uh, which is to say buying nitrogen and bringing it in, uh, chili and nitrate even, um, importing these inputs that are, you know, they're better inputs than industrial inputs, but they're still inputs coming from a long distance away. Um, that sort of reductionism, that nitrogen is nitrogen and I'll get it wherever I can and bring it in. Uh, mechanization. Um, a lot of uh, Cascadian farm uh, can no longer sh uh, buy from small farmers because they really need quantities of corn that you, you know, have to be combined and the combine can't make the turn in the three acre field. Um, and also they don't want the transaction cost. It's so much easier to deal with one large farm than 10 small farms. So you find this kind of, and you move into value added processing, uh, which is how you make money in food, not selling commodities, again, selling value added products. Um, so you get into a situation where we're moving organic strawberries across the country. Uh, Joan Gussow uh, had always quotes this famous statistic of, you know, when I'm in New York and I get a California strawberry, it's five calories of food energy that it takes 435 calories of fossil fuel energy to get to me. I mean, it's not a sustainable system, even though it's organic. Um, and you get things like organic uh, fast food. Um, this kind of thing. Um, I went to an organic, when I was doing this, I went to um, an organic chicken uh, operation and uh, Petaluma Poultry near me in California. That's where the chicken comes from these. And it's, uh, it's kind of a you know, high-end organic chicken place. Um, and I was curious to see what it was like. And it was a big industrial chicken operation. They did organic, but they also did kosher and they did Asian birds, which essentially just means you leave on the head and the feet. And, and industrial birds. And um, everything was the same except 
there was organic feed, uh, organic corn for the organic birds. Otherwise, it was the same. And they got no drugs, so they tended to die more often, so they had to charge more because they were losing more. And then, but, oh, it's free range. I thought, well, that's a real difference. And I asked them to show me um, how that worked. Well, free range is one of the great disappointments of being a food detective. Um, <clears throat> you got this 20,000 bird um, shed, you know, longer than this room with a lower ceiling. And at either end is a little door leading down to a six foot wide grass strip that runs along the whole side of the building. And there are no chickens in it though. Um, it's mowed carefully every now and then. And I said, why don't, why don't the chickens go out? And uh, um, they said, well, we, we don't open it till they're you know, five or six weeks old because we're afraid they're going to get disease because they're not getting antibiotics. Um, and then they, you know, we kill them in seven weeks. So it's really, you know, a two-week vacation option, you know. <laughs> it, it's not exactly a lifestyle for these chickens. And not having been accustomed to it, not having ever seen a chicken go outside, I mean, it's like those apartment cats who think, you know, if you open your door, it's like an alternative universe. You know, they never will go outside. Um, so free range is a joke, I'm afraid. At least it was here. Um, so these chickens may not get drugs. Um, they're getting organic feed. But they're still basically raised according to the exact same paradigm. Um, corn in, protein out. Okay? It's, a, it's a greener machine, but it's still a machine. Um, and uh, is it better? Do I buy this chicken given the alternative? I do. I do. I, I, I eat a lot of petaluma poultry, but um, it's a better bird. But it's hardly a new paradigm. It's hardly a whole new way of doing things. Um, it's more like a way to fine tune the old paradigm. And, um, it gets chickens off drugs and pesticides, and it's a cleaner product. So is there anything better out there? Well, I just want to tell you briefly, in, in the interest of leaving you not depressed, um, about another farm I've recently spent time on. And it, this farm is typical of nothing. Is it replicable? I don't know. But I'll just tell you a little bit about it, just to excite you, I hope, about the possibility of creating a very different kind of paradigm. Um, it's a farm some of you may have read about. I wrote a short article about it in Gourmet a couple years ago. Um, it's called Polyface Farm, and it's in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Joel Salatin is the farmer. Um, and he essentially practices an agriculture that is the opposite of, you know those terms I read to you, specialization, reductionism, mechanization? This farm is based on diversification, complexity, symbiosis, and context. And I'll explain what I mean. Joel calls himself a Christian conservative environmentalist, libertarian, lunatic farmer, and he is definitely all those things. Um, he's a very odd duck. He's not your typical uh, liberal, you know, college-educated organic farmer by any means. Uh, he's college-educated, but he went to Bob Jones University. And, well, that counts. Come on. Um, uh, I'll tell you how I met him. When I was researching... Um, uh, the beef story, I kept hearing about grass-fed beef, that you could get grass-fed beef. And, and I heard about this farmer who was growing this wonderful grass-fed beef in Virginia, and I called him up, and I did this long interview, and he gave me all these salty quotes about how horrible the industry is. And I said at the end, well, could you, could you FedEx me a couple of your steaks? I'd love to try them. And he said, sorry, I can't do that. And I said, well, you know, I can just give you the FedEx number. I can even tell the FedEx guy to show up with an insulated box. And he said, no, you don't understand. I don't believe in FedExing meat across the country. And that's when I realized he was kind of hardcore on his principles, uh, more so than I was. Um, uh, he really believes that sustainable has to encompass the entire food chain from beginning to end. How you sell it is as important as um, what you're selling. So I spent a day there a couple years ago, and then I went back this summer and spent a week, and I kind of worked on the farm and uh, lived with his mother in this trailer home behind the, uh, the house. And, um, and it, was a, it was a fascinating experience, actually, in a lot of ways. I, I've never worked so hard, um, and I realized why a lot of people were happy to let the animals go off their farms, because it means you can go to Florida in the winter and, and have a, you know, a better life in some ways. Um, these people are very tied to their animals. He grows um, half dozen species uh, on 100 acres. It's a small farm. He has 500 acres all told. 100 are open, 400 are woods. Um, cattle, pigs, rabbits, turkeys, 
um, chickens, both layers and broilers, and they're raised in this very intricate dance of symbiosis. Every species has a relationship with another species. No species does one thing. So I'll give you an example. Um, and he's created basically this completely artificial ecosystem consisting of these animals and grass. And it's important to point out that he, if you ask him what kind of farmer he is with those six animals, he'll say he's a grass farmer, which I never really understood. What does it mean to be a grass farmer? Nobody eats grass. You can't sell grass. Maybe you can sell hay. But grass is the keystone species. The whole thing begins with grass. If his grass is healthy, all the other animals will be healthy too. I need to speed up. Um, I'm almost done. Um, so I'll give you one example of one of these relationships. He grows, he has his grass-fed herd of cattle. They move every single day. He practices intensive grazing using portable fences, and they're on very tight paddocks, crowded together, just the way the, the, the bison were. Um, the, the model of intensive grazing is you imitate that kind of mob and move pattern of the bison, uh, which is very good for the grass and very good for the bison because they keep getting away from their waste. Um, so they spend one day in a paddock, and then they move to the next paddock. Sounds like a lot of work, but they get trained, and he opens the gate, and he's, and he's like a maitre d'. And they just <laughs> they head into the dining room. No work at all. Um, and it's actually quite easy. Um, then he waits three days. And in that three days, what he's waiting for is the larva in the manure of the cattle to grow. And after three days, it's fat and juicy and makes excellent food for the chickens. So then he moves in this portable chicken mobile, which is this very ramshackle portable coop. And he opens the door, and the chickens fan out the layers. And they start pecking through the manure, and they eat all the grubs. And they spread the manure with their pecking. Um, and they get a very important source of protein, and they eliminate his pest problem. He does not have to use ivermectin. Uh, he doesn't have a fly problem. Um, because the birds are his sanitation crew. Um, they are eating grass, and they're eating these grubs and all the other insects. Um, and they get some corn, too. I mean, they do get their, their feed. They need a certain amount of it. Um, and they stay for a couple of days, and then they move out. Um, and then the rabbits might move in, some animal that grazes in a different way. Um, he grows chickens in uh, the broiler chickens in these portable pens that are moving every day. The key, the key rule on this farm is mobility. There are no fixed structures except one hay barn. Um, give me one more example of a great relationship. So, so what you see is that um, each species is, gets to kind of express its physiological distinctiveness. Chicken is not treated as a machine. It's treated as something that, that um, is a member in a relationship. Um, so not only does uh, uh, the chicken is responsible for insect control, protein production, manure spreading, and nitrogen application, because he's using the chickens essentially to bring nitrogen into his pastures. Um, and he knows exactly how many days that at this time of year, two days, uh, 500 chickens is all the nitrogen that can be absorbed without running off, and then he moves them. So it's this very intricate uh, choreography, and, he has, and you have to be a very knowledgeable farmer to pull it off uh, and avoid any kind of pollution problems. There is no waste on this farm. Every creature's waste is another creature's lunch. Um, but my favorite example is um, uh, his pigs, which he calls the piggerators. In the winter, for just three months, the, the cattle come indoors so they don't trash the, the pastures and they eat uh, hay that he's grown. Um, then they go out in, uh, uh, he doesn't uh, shovel out the manure, though, every day or every couple days. He just layers it with carbon, uh, with wood chips and with, with straw. Um, and along the way, he throws in corn. This is the subtext of our whole talk tonight. He throws in whole ears of corn um, and handfuls of, of kernel corn. And then more cow manure another layer, and the bedding is rising all winter. And in fact, he's built this portable feed gate so he can keep raising it for the animals because it gets three and a half feet off the ground by March. And they're standing on this bedding. And what this bedding is is this layer cake that is having this anaerobic composting process. It's creating warmth, keeping the barn warm. More warmth means they need less feed. Um, and then the cows go out. And then what he does next is he brings in his pigs. And what the pigs do 
is they smell that fermented corn down at the bottom of that compost pile, and they go for it. And so the pigs, and I saw this when I was there two marches ago, the pigs are like all completely vertical. <laughs> all you see are their tails and these hams, right? They look like submarines. And they're just going through, digging this and turning this entire compost pile over. It, it instantly turns into an aerobic composting. And they had only been at it a week. And I could pick up a handful of this compost. And it just smelled like the forest floor you know, in the spring. It was just this wonderful compost. And that's what the pigs do for him uh, in exchange for And he just sits and watches them work. Um, he doesn't believe in turning compost. He has pigs to do that. Um, so what it suggests is um, there are other ways to do it. They're complicated. They take a lot of work, a lot of thought, a lot of creativity. Um, but there isn't, there's no reason that farmers can't be as ingenious as the Silicon, you know, the Silicon Valley engineers de designing our software. And if that kind of energy and attention was put into the problems of growing our food, just think what we could come up with. Um, and um, uh, so anyway, I, I just, uh, there's, there's, he's written some books that I encourage you to get on the web, um, books written for farmers. And uh, they're, they're wonderful, funny books. He's a very funny guy. So anyway, let me go back and, and just wrap up um, so I can take your questions. Now, I've been telling these stories about food and food systems and food chains because I've come to believe that stories are really critical, especially to redeeming that ugly word, consumer. Um, in our industrial food chain, the consumer is kept as far away from the producer as possible. There's, there's a wall of not knowing between producers and consumers. The only information that's traveling right now is a number. It's price and yield. That's really the only information that gets conveyed. And that's very destructive. Because when the only information passing back and forth is a number, um, you get carelessness on both sides. You get consumers who, who don't feel there's any percentage to them to giving farmers a living wage. You get farmers who don't really realize they're growing food for people. The, the corn farmer I wrote about uh, in Iowa for my book, I asked him one day, who are, you growing, um, who are you growing all this corn for? You know, this 200 bushels an acre. And he didn't skip a beat. He said, the military industrial complex. He didn't say an eater. He said a system. And he was right in a lot of ways. Um, the industrial food system doesn't like to tell stories about food because the stories it has to tell are not very appetizing ones, as I, as I hope I, I told you by telling you a little bit about where hamburgers like this come from. Um, so the answer to that, to that limited information, to that ignorance in the food chain, is really stories, is, is a more transparent food chain. When people know where their food comes from, they tend to make much better decisions. Um, Suddenly the consumer, when you enrich that mode of communication, when you include story, when you have a transparent food chain, um, suddenly the consumer realizes he or she is not just a consumer, but also a kind of creator. Um, that his food dollar represents a vitally important vote for the well-being of the producer and his, his or her way of life, for the welfare of the animals, for the biodiversity of their species, and for a certain kind of place. Um, because farmers produce a lot more than food. They produce a particular landscape, a particular kind of community, and consumers need to understand that. Um, indeed, the best way to protect, I, I, I come from New England, and I love the New England landscape, that, you know, that, those rolling hills with the, um, uh, you know, with the hedgerows and stone walls, a um, little bit of forest, a little bit of um, open field, and that every landscape, that one, every landscape is a physical manifestation of a certain kind of food chain. Um, the fast food chain creates a very different kind of landscape. It's the landscape of the strip. It's the landscape of the monoculture field. Um, and we can't simply save landscapes because we like them and write checks to environmental organizations. The better way to save landscapes is to support food chains that produce landscapes you love. Um, that New England landscape was created by farmers. But not just farmers. Yes, they built the walls and they cut the trees, but it's farmers and their animals who created the open space. And they're eaters, too, the eaters of those animals. We all created that landscape together. 
So you see, I'm talking about a much richer conception about who the consumer is, what it means to consume. I've always hated that word. I hated being referred to. I hated that identity. Um, consumer is such a one-dimensional person. You know, it's somebody motivated by the narrowest, most selfish interests, you know, prowling the aisles of the supermarket, looking for the good deal. Um, he's become, in our society, the opposite of the citizen. We have consumers, we have citizens, and they're separate. And we're, we're instructed to act like consumers for most of our lives and make our decisions based on our narrowest economic self-interest. Whereas when we're citizens, supposedly, we're to take a more expansive view and think about the common, the commonwealth, the common wheel. Um, well, there's no reason that those two characters can't be married again, consumers and citizens. Um, we don't have to accept that divorce. Um, and it's starting to happen. I mean, I think you see it with certain labels. You see it with uh, humanely raised, organic, fairly traded. You see it in farmers markets. You see it in CSAs. Um, we have the power to redefine what it means to say something is good value, to redefine what a value meal is. It's a meal with values we can stand behind. Um, and that what these stories teach is that in our consuming, we are also producers. Um, Carlo Petrini, the head of Slow Food, coined this phrase, speaking of this, he called us co-creators, and I think it's a very nice one. Um, in, and that's creator is in the most important and precious sense of the word. Food is so much more than fuel for our bodies, protein and carbohydrates and vitamins. That's what a reductive view. What we eat attaches our bodies and our minds to the earth. And in our eating, we remake the earth, either for the better or worse. With our eating decisions, we can help create the world we want to live in. One grass-fed burger, one quart of milk at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I've got, I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions if, if uh, there are people who want to stick around and, and listen to them or ask them. Uh, there's, a mi there's a microphone set up in the center. His name is Joel Salatin, S-A-L-A-T-I-N. Sure. Any questions? Yeah. Do you want to come over to the microphone? I'm sorry, from where? Western Iowa. Uh -huh. uh, also a long time Anyway, uh, I'm not sure how many people even know about this in this room, but just this week, uh, the Iowa Senate passed legislation that would preempt any local control over where uh, seeds can be planted. And uh, so I wanted you to realize that, if you haven't heard that, that there's still time to do something uh, we are, a group of us are asking uh, you, your, for your help, to try to uh, uh, ask Governor Vilsack to veto this bill and ask for the Interim Study Committee so that the issues can be studied so that uh, uh, all sides have a, have a chance, you know, at the table on this uh, very important discussion. And what, what this leads up to really is my question. And it's probably addressed to everyone in this room as much as it is to you, is that here in Iowa, you know, we are still in the throes of this industrial expansion. And it uh, looks like it's going to get much worse very quickly in terms of who's going to take over the farms. And I'm really talking about what Fred has talked about so you know, much and so eloquently as the farmers in the middle. They're, we're running out of time. We only have a few years left for farmers my age, you know, this generation. And that might be about 50 to 60,000 farms in Iowa that really do have an opportunity to uh, control their destiny if they would consider going organic or some version thereof. Uh, you know, we've been involved in organic food production for a long time. 
just that as, that's an example that this in a complicated industrial system, even for an organic cooperative like Organic Valley, who we grow for, who cannot get enough cattle in this country that are organic, so they have to go to, to uh, Australia to import beef. So I guess my question is, you know, does it, how, how much worse does it have to get? Before it gets before, better? Before it gets better, uh, before we wake up. Uh, and we could avoid some of this pain if places like Iowa State, for instance, would start realizing what's at stake here with, let's say, losing 50,000 businesses in the next five to 10 years and replacing them with, you know, a handful of corporate feudal structures. Yeah, I, you know, that's a very hard question. Um, I don't know what it takes. It probably takes a lot of different things. I mean, it's, you know, we haven't talked about agricultural policy, too. I mean, the, the government, you know, this is, we're, we're not operating in a free market system. We forget. Um, we think, you know, when we talk about this industrial logic, it is very much the product of political decisions, policy decisions made in Washington, the nature of the kind of farm bill we have, the, the kind of agriculture we choose to support and the kind of agriculture we choose not to support. Um, the farm bill is a, uh, it's always been a mystery to me that nobody on the coast pays any attention to it whatsoever. Um, it's regarded as this parochial matter that's left to be fought out between the farm state senators. And um, I've always thought if we really recognized it for what it is, as a food bill. Um, as a, a, you, you have to understand people in New York don't really understand their connection of agriculture and food, or really particularly see that there is one. Um, I, I can never go to an editor in New York and say I want to write an article on agriculture. They'll just fall asleep. But if I say I want to write about food, they're very interested. Um, so something similar has happened with agricultural policy. If the eaters took an interest in agricultural policy, uh, and we all started realizing this is our fight um, as people who want to eat clean, healthy, wholesome food. Um, we could have a very different agriculture in this country. Um, that I think it will take political will at the national level. I mean, a real debate about agriculture. One of the sad things that happens every four years is that every presidential candidate comes through Iowa and essentially assumes that they have to kind of bow down before the subsidy system we have, whatever we have, um, and basically tell, them, tell farmers what they think farmers want to hear. And there's never any real debate about what kind of agriculture we want. Um, and uh, it's, for some reason, it's not in the political realm. Um, I actually think the thing that might inspire a politics around food in this country, and therefore around farming, is the obesity crisis. The obesity crisis has gotten the attention of policymakers. It will get the attention of the entire industrial system because it threatens to bankrupt the healthcare system. Um, it's, it's starting to already. And there is an increasing understanding that the problems of obesity are problems of agriculture. Um, the fact that we subsidize the least healthy calories in the supermarket, which is to say added fat and added sugar, which is to say, by the way, a lot of soybean and corn. Um, what would it take to subsidize healthier calories in the, in the supermarket? I mean, those are kind of discussions that we need to start having. And um, if we began to have that, I think the virtues of growing different kinds of food, more diversified farming, selling and, and eating more whole foods rather than processed foods. Um, the industrialized system is fed by the entire food chain. It starts with the supermarkets and works back to the farms. And, and it's the Walmarts that, that are, are much more content with the largest possible farm unit. Um, it makes everybody's life easier along the way. Not that, you know, we know those large farms are not more efficient necessarily. Um, so that the other battle is to find new ways to sell food um, outside of the supermarket. I don't think there's a future in selling food in supermarkets if you're trying to do alternative agriculture. Um, it may work now, it may work for a while. Um, but they will force the same kind of values down the food chain sooner or later. Um, because, again, you're selling commodities. The only way to sell commodities is to get bigger and more mechanized. And um, uh, so I think that 
working on new distribution systems. And again, there's another role for the government too in farmers markets, in uh, fostering just new ways of getting our food and on, on direct sales too. Um, is a very important piece of the puzzle. So I don't have answers, but those are a couple of things that I think have to happen before the, the future that we all hope for uh, can be realized. Thank you for your question. Yeah. You did point it up a little bit more, so yeah. You can't remember. I certainly can't remember. Um, well, the subsidy issue is a really complicated one, and there are people in this room who understand it better than I do. Um, but from what I've been able to learn, I was also very enchanted with the idea that we should simply eliminate subsidies and that that would fix many problems. Um, but people who've been at this issue longer than I have um, would ask me questions like, well, why did we get to subsidies in the first place? And if you go back to the history, you realize that um, we started having a federal agriculture policy because we had too much corn, <laughs> too much grain. It was the same problem in the 20s. We had overproduction, low, really low prices. Um, the price of corn fell to zero or very close to it uh, at one point in 1930 or 31. Um, so the government got involved to essentially um, support prices by removing grain from the market, um, loaning farmers money so they didn't have to sell into a very weak market and force prices down further. The system worked more or less for several decades. Um, it, it supported prices. It took away the incentive to overproduce. There was no need to do it. Um, and. Uh, so there's a danger that simply removing, and we left that system for, for interesting reasons, having to do with the fact that the buyers of cheap grain, uh, the processors by and large, Cargill and ADM and companies like that, didn't really like that system. And, and they helped persuade the government, which was happy to move this way because food prices got very high in the 70s, that if you just cut checks directly to farmers and let them sell right into that weak market, um, we'd have more cheap food and everybody would be happy. And, and so we kind of moved to that system. Uh, but my point is that by simply removing um, the subsidies, you might end up with the same crises of overproduction that got you into farm policy in the first place. You know, I don't know that there's a society in history that's really had a completely free market agriculture. I mean, there, the nature of agriculture is such that, um, you know, even the 16th century um, um, Mexicans had an agricultural policy. They had grain reserves. In the Bible, they write about grain reserves and the need to take grain out of the market. In, during big harvests, you've got it for wheat harvests. I mean, that's to keep people fed, but it's also to keep agricultural markets from spiking in ways that destroy people's lives. Um, so, you, you know, it may be that you need some system, and it's obviously the system we have isn't working, but this mantra to simply get rid of the subsidies um, uh, you know, may not actually fix the problem and, uh, and may do an awful lot of damage in the process of trying to. The New Zealand case is often held up as a great success. And um, I don't know enough about it. I'm very curious actually to go and see how it works um, because it is, uh, they did move from a grain agriculture to a grass-based agriculture, um, which I, I think, by the way, is a very uh, interesting solution for places like Iowa. I mean, imagine the grass you could grow here. Imagine the grass that did grow here. Um, you know, why, why take corn off these farms and send it to be turned into cattle feed hundreds of miles away to produce meat to then come back here? I mean, why not just let the animals harvest their own food, fertilize their own fields? They can do this. Um, 
and uh, and the, the the technology of, of intensive grass grazing, you know, has come a long way from the last time there was a lot of cattle on farms in Iowa. Um, and the economics actually are, uh, you know, right now are, would be quite good because there's a very good market for grass-fed beef. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different solutions and, uh, that need to be looked at. But there is a moment of change. I think there is change coming. Uh, it's being forced by the World Trade Organization. Uh, it's being forced by the fact that the, the Bush has bankrupted the government. Um, so there will be new farm policies. The challenge is, though, to be ready with good ideas when that vacuum occurs, because the vacuum is coming. And their people are going to have some really bad ideas. It's a very good question, though. The other thing I will tell you is that Joel Salatin is the happiest farmer I've ever met. He may be one of the hardest working farmers I've ever met, but he's also really happy. He's really happy because he's doing very creative work. He's inventing things. He's um, a great observer. His life is varied and complex. What he does in, in the course of a day, uh, he, he, he doesn't do one thing for more than an hour. Um, there's so many different kinds of things to do. Um, I think it, it comes it really comes from a deeper cultural shift toward not looking to our work for our pleasure. And when you look at your work as something to be gotten away from, to, to, to have the pleasures of entertainment, uh, of travel, of video games, of um, uh, you know, going to the movies, um, and you don't find pleasure in your work, I think that's, how you, that, that's what moves people into that kind of trap. Um, that you want to make as much time as possible for your leisure, your recreation, rather than your creation. And um, so it's, it's, it is, it's about very deep things in American culture. I think that's absolutely true. And I, you know, I don't minimize the, the, the role of um, leisure in, in creating industrial agriculture. Um, it is, you know, it's something that a lot of people chose because it appeared to offer a better lifestyle. In the end, you know, I mean, it, it, it ends up with the other member of the couple having to go work at a job in town because it no longer supports people. I mean, it, it hasn't really worked out. Um, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, vacation homes in Florida, I'm guessing, uh, supported by corn farmers in Iowa. Um, uh, but it was the temptation. Um, yeah. Um, I am from Iowa, and I agree that this is a really interesting question. Um, I've been interested actually in Joe South for 10 years in his work and previous approaches to this kind of problem. Um, I have also just an observation. I look forward to a time when uh, the, the ecologists at the university here work to teach the farmers, to teach in the yard ecologists, right around the set. And there are people here trying to change that, but that's the solution seems to me. Uh, where <coughs> what we know about ecology and learn yeah. farmer is what goes out and what you do. And I think actually his model is already good enough. We should be teaching it. That's my bias. Um, the solution to this large scale problem is to design small scale systems to replace it with false. Yeah. So that's what we need to do. I think you're absolutely right, and I think that that's an important part of the. In my observation, I just want to encourage everybody right at this university, which I am not, that they need to be doing that and taking it seriously. 
Yeah, I, I think you make a very good point, and I'm going to end on this. Um, uh, there is uh, so much that ecologists could teach farmers, and farmers could teach ecologists. And um, uh, you know, why doesn't why isn't this kind of thing taught? Um, and I, you know, I ask myself that question. One of the reasons it's not taught is that nobody makes any money teaching it. Joel Salatin buys less stuff than any other farmer I know of. Um, you know, he has his tractor and he has this little four-wheeler to get around the farm and he buys a few tons of, of uh, chicken feed a year, but he doesn't buy any fertilizer, he doesn't buy any drugs, um, he doesn't buy a lot of uh, equipment, he doesn't buy compost turners. So to the extent that agricultural education is because the government has backed off of supporting it, is supported by industry. Industry doesn't make any money off of Joel Salatin's, and that's a, that's a fundamental problem. Um, and it's a problem generally with organic agriculture um, that uh, the the there's less room for the input manufacturers, and that is you know very they uh, you, you well know they're very powerful people in agriculture. Um, and that's why the, the retreat of the public sector from, from funding agricultural research is such a disaster because it creates a vacuum into which only certain kinds of solutions, the ones I was describing that essentially are selling new fixes for problems created by the last fix. And, um, uh, and that's really what we have to break out of. Thank you very much. There are excellent questions. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I forgot to say, I, I will be in the back signing books, and I think it looks like there's some refreshments, so uh, we can continue this conversation there. Thanks a lot.